Okay, we're gonna get started. Um, we've got a full room and I see lots of uh, familiar names and uh, lots of uh, really interesting details about where people are from. We've got Istanbul in the room. Wow, thank you for joining us. Um, we've got New York, hello Ari. We've, we've got Boston, hello Woody. We've got Utah. Um, so welcome everyone. It's uh, really great that we're uh, able to um, meet together for this really exciting event uh, for Click. So I'm going to just jump in with an introduction and say, hello, my name is Tony. I am in Boston. I am the Managing Director at the Center for Law, Innovation, and Creativity, who is hosting this event. Um, this event is called the New Digital Divide, and it's part of a, a three-part series, actually, um, that focuses on um, IP and tech. And our theme this year looks at the ways that uh, tech companies and the lack of regulation seems to have created a new type of divide where um, for a long time the argument um, has been that we need accessible or, or we need uh, equitable access rather to technology and now we're living in a time where technology is accessing us. So if we think about contact tracing, if we think about the triangulation of social media data, um, you know, pinging our phones to, you know, for geolocation um, features, um, we're, we're we're entering this, um, or have already entered this, this new and really interesting time about um, what it means to live in the digital world today. So that is the theme that informs um, and has shaped our theme, um, or, or shaped our series for the, uh, um, for this academic year. And we are happy that are delighted to be joined by our first speaker, um, who is, I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted because a ton of notifications are going off and I thought I turned them all off. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna stop pretending like I don't hear them. I'm just like, shh, <laughs> right now. Um, so anyways, uh, I'm delighted to be, we're delighted to be joined by our, our first speaker. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Professor Woody Hartzog, who is a faculty member at Click or at the Northeastern University School of Law, of which um, Click is, uh, where Click is housed, to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see you all on here. Um, it's a, a joy that uh, even in these times we can still get together. Uh, my job is to introduce uh, one of my dearest friends in the world, Ryan Palo. Uh, on paper, I'm going to put Ryan's bio in the chat because you can read uh, a lot of the accolades uh, that Ryan has. Ryan is the Lane Powell and D. Wayne Gittinger. Did I pronounce that right, Ryan? Uh, uh, Associate Professor at the University of Washington School of Law. Um, that's his title. You can learn a lot from him. Uh, Ryan is an absolute leader in several fields, so much so that it's difficult to summarize. Uh, he wrote some pivotal privacy uh, law scholarship uh, on things like privacy harms, things on uh, online manipulation, which many of us routinely cite uh, on, with almost every article that we write. Uh, Ryan has led the way on robotics and artificial intelligence law and policy scholarship, writing some key articles on drones uh, and bots and free speech. Um, he is also working on a hotly anticipated book about law and the field of law and technology generally, um, which I highly uh, commend to all of you to keep an eye out for when it comes out. Um, uh, Ryan's the co-director uh, of the Multidisciplinary Tech Policy Lab and the co-founder of it as well. Uh, someone that's done an incredible amount of work and I highly um, uh, commend you to, to, look at it, to look at that. He also is the co-founder for the We Robot Conference with Michael Frumkin and our dearly departed friend, Ian Kerr, um, uh, which is the premier conference for uh, law and uh, robotics and artificial intelligence discussions uh, in the United States. And if I may be so bold, Ryan, the world, um, <laughs> and maybe or maybe not, but um, there's a lot of things that I could say about Ryan with respect to all of this. Um, and uh, suffice it to say, he is on the vanguard of his issues. Um, I could also tell you about some of the personal relationships um, that Ryan has formed, not only with many senior scholars in the field, but the incredible job that he does uh, working with junior scholars and being an incredible mentor and a guide for everyone in this area. Someone that I'm uh, uh, eternally grateful um, to know and have in our community. 
Um, I can tell you about the time that he and I skipped out on a major conference to go see the movie Her uh, in New York City in the middle of a blizzard because it was probably relevant to artificial intelligence and the law and policy. Um, or the time that we stayed out so late at We Robot that we missed the whole first part of the next conference. And I'm not going to tell you about those times, but I am going to tell you about one story that might embarrass Ryan just a little bit. And he doesn't, I don't even know if he knows this story. So at one We Robot conference, we had adjourned for the evening and we were all sitting at a, uh, a, a restaurant outside and Ryan was sort of holding court with some of the junior scholars that were new to We Robot. And as he always does, he was being insightful and witty and warm and, uh, and welcoming and everyone was having a good time. And then Ryan excused himself. I think he went to, to uh, the bar to, to uh, maybe grab another drink or something to eat. And I was in earshot of these two junior scholars and they turned to each other and audibly said, can you believe we are talking to Ryan Kahlo? <laughs> and I don't know if I ever told him that or not, but um, it captured the kind of uh, enthusiasm that Ryan brings and the importance of his scholarship. Um, as someone that, that I consider to be a leading light in our field. And so um, can you all believe that we are getting to hear Ryan Kahlo, welcome to Northeastern University virtually. Thank you very much, Ryan. Wow, thank you. Um, that uh, that has to be maybe the, uh, the uh, warmest introduction that I <laughs> that maybe I've I've had, um, and I really appreciate it uh, very very much, Woody. You know, I I right back at you. I mean. Um, you know, you've, you've been an inspiration. And um, so a couple of quick things. So first of all, um, We Robot, the conference that um, Woody mentioned is actually happening virtually this week. And so there's gonna be like a launch event and then you're gonna be able to see um, some of the um, uh, pre-recorded but really lively and, and generative um, uh, sessions at We Robot this week. So keep an eye out for that. They're, they're the, the folks at um, Ottawa are, um, yeah, thank you, Woody. Just put it in the in the chat. Um, the other thing I would say is that you know, speaking of Ian, who um, who Woody mentioned, um, you know, Ian uh, was really the model um, for for at least at least for me, and I think for many many people in terms of how to engage with um, the community as a whole, junior and 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 peer and the like. Um, he was just was such a a warm and intellectually generous and just engaging person. Um, and so, um, you know, those of us who were, who were lucky to know him well um, benefited hugely from his uh, mentoring and his example. Um, that, well, that was quite a, a, a deep loss. Um, uh, among others, by the way, Ari, another example of that uh, would be uh, Joel uh, Reidenberg at, at Fordham. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's been a time of, um, of great loss uh, in, in, recent, in recent years. Um, so I am, I am so excited to, to, let, to give a lecture today um, at, at Northeastern um, and at Click. And I gotta say that, you know, um, Northeastern in my view is, is doing it right. Um, and so as Woody alluded to, I'm in the middle of researching um, a book about law and technology and sort of how do fields come to be formed, what are best practices and, and the like. Um, and in my view, Northeastern is doing the exact right thing. So first of all, um, you know, one of the things that I've learned over the last you know, decade or so has been that there are very few interesting questions out there that are capable of resolution by reference to any one discipline. And so increasingly you need to hold hands across disciplines. Maybe you have dual training. Maybe you, you just talk to folks who, who are in other disciplines. You're looking at other disciplines and they are also in turn looking to us as legal scholars. Um, and I think it's important that we both recognize the importance of holding hands across disciplines, um, but also that we as legal scholars make ourselves and our work known and available to folks in other disciplines who turns out are quite excited about it when they, when they are realize it. And so one of the things that Northeastern does so well is to sort of try to merge those two things institutionally through cross appointment, through hiring people with, with dual training, 
uh, through having programs like this one that are that are deeply interdisciplinary. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, in the speaker series, I cannot recommend more that you would also uh, tune in to Kate Darling and Joan Donovan, who are just two absolutely leading lights in their respective fields. One in the social uh, aspects of robotics. Um, she's also a huge IP scholar, but you know, let's let's just focus on the on the probably what her talk will be about, uh, and the other in the field of misinformation and disinformation. And I've gotten. Um, I'm relatively new to this field. I, I've only been working in the field of disinformation and misinformation for maybe the past um, six months to a year, but I'm part of a new center at University of Washington. Um, and I cannot tell you how important um, she, her work is to that, to, that, uh, to that set of inquiry about you know, uh, misinformation and disinformation and so on. Um, so I highly recommend that. Uh, so you're gonna hear about, <laughs> you're gonna hear about social robots you're gonna hear about misinformation and like what's, you know, and I'm gonna to talk to you about, I'm gonna to talk to you about administrative law. I'm gonna to talk to you about administrative law. Now, for the law students out there, there is a rumor that is circulating in law schools that administrative law is boring. That is not a true, that is not true. That is fake news, all right? I mean, administrative law is super exciting. It's really, really interesting. And so, you know, that is not a hard pitch anymore because of the way in which um, administrative agencies are coming to the fore due to politics right now, right? Um, you know, and so for example, you know, whether it's like the faithless Department of Justice, you know, uh, which is full of, you know, in incredible um, prosecutors, um, uh, some of whom have been dear, dear friends of mine, just really uh, amazing people, but in the leadership, right now it's just you know it's just in, in front of us because it's just so faithless at the moment um uh, to the manufactured uh uh incompetence of the u.s postal service which has been doing nothing but like you know making money and like you know connecting us and it's now uh, facing political pressure um at a very difficult moment um to worries about political pressure at the food at the fda at the center for disease control um, you know, it's in it's in our minds, right? So we're thinking about agencies and agency heads and and, and politics, um, and uh, uh, so so it's 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 in the fore. Um, but you know, I'm going to be talking about um, something a little a little different from the influence of politics on on agencies. Although, as we'll see, hopefully at the end of my remarks, there is a there is a political economy story here. It is about politics in, in, in the end, um, but I'm gonna focus on, on algorithms, uh, not uh, necessarily on politics, okay? Um, and the, the talk I'm gonna give uh, draws from um, uh, this, this work that I co-wrote with someone who I can't believe is actually uh, taking time out of her day to, to watch me talk about our paper, but Danielle Citrin, um, who is a, uh, magical uh, force of nature and uh, you know the leading person in, in multiple fields and I hope that Danielle you'll feel like you should jump in because this is your work um, <laughs> too uh, and so it's lovely lovely to have you on here but you can hear how I frame our paper to other people now from from this yeah um, and so um, and so the, so the so the question that I'm taking up today has to do with um, with the use of algorithms by governments now, the use of algorithms by governments is also in the news. Um, and it's in the news in a very specific way. So for example, I, I can't imagine that you've missed the um, protest by UK students, students in Wales um, and other parts of, of, you know, so students who have, who have protested in Europe, the use of algorithms to determine what their grade should be because the, coronavirus is not making it possible to do the same kind of testing. And so they're, they're, they're using algorithms to anticipate what grades are gonna be. And um, they've been resoundingly criticized on a number of levels, but also specifically because um, as Virginia Eubanks would anticipate, as, as many people would anticipate, um, they, they disadvantage people of, of lower socioeconomic status. Um, so that was one of the complaints about them. And so you see these like literal bodies in the street, you know, people, people uh, on the ground on campus uh, protesting the use of an algorithm uh, by a, a quasi, you know, by an institution in order to make decisions that are material to their lives. Um, 
you see it in, in the United States, you know, time and again, there's been a, a number of wonderful books uh, written about it. Algorithms of Oppression, for example, um, um, the, the, book I, the, the book I mentioned by, by Eubanks as well, um, uh, another book by um, uh, the Weapons of Math Destruction. There's been a, a bunch of, of discussions about algorithms, but very notably, we saw maybe the first instance or at least one of the first instances um, of uh, an individual actually being indicted as a result of facial recognition not working well. Um, uh, so that was uh, Robert Williams, who was, who was falsely arrested and even in, in, indicted on, uh, on the basis that, um, that uh, or at a minimum arrested on the basis that, he, that a system appeared to match him to as, as being at the scene of a crime. And of course it wasn't, it wasn't so. Um, and so we see that and it's highly, highly uh, uh, visible. Um, and so when you see headlines like these that talk about algorithms by used by the government, algorithms used by institutions, they tend to look a particular way. And the headlines say things like, government relying on algorithms that are biased and flawed. Okay, governments relying on, on algorithms that are biased and flawed. And the public at a minimum, and many, many scholars um, additionally, focus on the latter half of that sentence, that the algorithms are biased and flawed, okay? And that is incredibly important work, incredibly important work. I mean, the fact that these things are biased and flawed is hugely important. It's important at the individual level because of the ways in which they're affecting real people's lives and lived experiences. It's important at a, at a structural level because of the way in which algorithms um, uh, and automation uh, tend to reify and, and reinforce and amplify um, uh, racial and, and gender and other biases within, within our, our society. So it's very, very important work. But the work that, that um, uh, the emphasis of, of our paper, of Danielle and my paper, I think it's fair to say, um, is really on the former, right? Not that governments are turning to algorithms that are flies, that are biased and, 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 and flawed, right? But that they're turning to algorithms, that they're turning to algorithms. And governments turn to algorithms for a wide variety of reasons, some of which are perfectly understandable, right? Uh, that, that is to say, the mode, that, that they're addressing a, a, a real, a perception of a real problem. Even the sentencing algorithms, which have been so deeply problematic, um, even the, the, the bail algorithm, you know, the algorithms to determine um, whether you'll be detained prior to, to your um, uh, defendant will be detained prior to their, their trial, even those you know, have, have reasons behind them that we might think of as actually being in some small ways noble. Now, embracing algorithms instead may have been a terrible mistake and isn't maybe it, or the wrong thing to do, but the, but the base motivation had to do with the idea that the bail system, because it privileged people who were able to come up with the resources to get themselves out of jail prior to having their, their, their court appearance, systematically um, it affected vulnerable populations um, uh, uh, was, was racially um, uh, discriminatory, uh, was socioeconomically discriminatory, right? Um, in the case of, of administrative agencies, um, these big, you know, uh, uh, these big state and federal agencies, um, there also might be good reasons to turn to turn towards automation, or at least a perception that there is good reasons to do that. Um, but the point is that they're they're actually doing it. Um, you know, there was a recent study uh, at Stanford um, that looked at the plans for the federal government, and particularly for agencies. In fact, it was in um, cooperation with a. Um, uh, an, agency, a, a, an agency within the federal government that actually studies administrative law. That's how interesting administrative law is, that there's a whole agency within the government and all they do all the time is study administrative law all the time. Um, and so, so they, they, they worked together and they found that a huge percentage of agencies were either using, federal agencies were either using machine learning or, or, or experimenting with or considering using machine learning uh, within artificial intelligence. Um, and so that you, we may see a sort of wholesale um, a pivot towards, towards that um, with mixed effects. Um, but you know, what 
what Danielle and I know and what many people on this, on this, uh, in this meeting know or in this uh, lecture know um, is, that, is that agencies have been using automation for a long time. Okay, well before machine learning or even algorithm that was a household name, or a household word, right? They've been using it for a long time. Over, over the last few decades, agencies, particularly state agencies, have been turning more and more to automation to carry out their functions in society, whether they're making decisions about who should get certain benefits or getting, the, getting them taken away, they're making decisions about who should um, gain admittance to something, how people should be evaluated in terms of merit for their jobs, um, and so on and so on. Agencies are turning to automation and have been for decades and decades. So in, in many ways, you look at the Stanford study and it's a, it's a story about how like, hey, look, agencies are thinking about, are do, about doing AI um, and you know, you're, you're, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but it's happening. Um, you're sort of reminded of, um, I don't know if I'll get this exactly right because I don't have it in front of me, but I'm reminded of a, of a quote um, by one of my colleagues in computer science here at the University of Washington, uh, Pedro D Domingos, who in his book uh, wrote that, you know, the problem with artificial intelligence is not um, that it's going to be too smart and take over. Um, it's that it's too dumb and already has. Right, um, and so the basic idea here is that you know while we're watching to see how agencies are experimenting with this gee whiz bang new technology of artificial intelligence, you know we got to keep our eye on the fact that they have long deployed software and automation, especially in the state context, but not exclusively. I mean, there's also the no-fly list, for example, which is a federal program where reliance on algorithms that affects people's liberty. Um, but you know, anyway, a lot is going on in the states, um, and so. Um, and you know, it, it, automation is not always a bad thing, right? I mean, so for example, I reference the, um, you know, I reference the postal service. Like, if it's an automated mail sorter, right, that like helps people do their job, maybe we shouldn't dismantle it right before we do mail-in voting. Uh, if it's working perfectly well and helping, I mean, automation is not in intrinsically bad, um, but uh, automation used to make decisions about people's lives um, is 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 and can be problematic. So um, the legal literature, and I'm really talking about the legal literature here for now, but the discourse in law has long foregrounded the way in which automation by agencies um, interferes with um, process, the process, the process that is due um, by virtue of the constitution, by virtue of um, uh, federal law, particularly the uh, Administrative Procedure Act. You know, lawyers uh, were obsessed with process at one level. And, and so what, what, what many people um, have looked at or have been looking at is the way in which automation, when you substitute a, a system, a, a computer system or an algorithm for what a person used to do, that in a sort of classic law and, uh, law and technology way, that substitution then um, uh, causes a, a, a breakdown of the requisite safeguards that we put in place for our values, okay? Um, and so you see that in literature dating back decades, okay? So you see that, for example, when Danielle and I were, were researching our, our paper, we found examples you know, from Paul Schwartz from the 1990s. And of course, Danielle herself has two papers in the same year, you know, now um, uh, 15, 10, 15 years ago. Um, I think those papers are in 2008. Can I get a nod? Yeah, okay. So in, in 2008, writing about this phenomenon and technological due process, for example, which is just required reading in, in our field, um, Danielle describes the ways in which, um, in which uh, uh, the shift to automation, the shift to algorithms um, has displaced safeguards for everything from, you know, uh, rulemaking, like making new rules and having public participation. Uh, that has been sort of um, uh, sublimated into software in a way that is hard to pick apart and hard to challenge. Um, to individual decisions that the constitutional years guarantees you're supposed to get before material benefits are taken away from you and so on. And she showed very elegantly uh, all the ways in which our safeguards have 
fallen away or been eroded. And she came up with a number of um, very helpful ways to address this deficit, okay? Um, and in addition to Danielle's work, I mean, Danielle's work in a, in a sense has sort of spawned this cottage industry around thinking about, about process and automation, right? So you see wonderful work by Kate Crawford and Jason Schultz. Um, you see, um, uh, and, and, you know, any number of papers I could, I could point you to where, where there is a, a very thick, you know, creative, rigorous discussion of the way in which process has been interrupted by automation and can be restored, okay? Um, and that too is incredibly important, incredibly important. Now, in recent years in sort of other disciplines, in addition to law, but in an interdisciplinary conversation, um, on fairness, accountability, and transparency. We've also seen um, computer scientists, statisticians, um, people in the humanities, critical scholars, and others interrogating algorithms, but still focusing on that, um, you know, on, on that, that part of the headline, the flaws and the biases. And some people have been making really important moves saying, you know, um, it's not just about whether the algorithm works or doesn't work or doesn't work for this population or does, it's about who, who is, is being put under the lens of, of algorithms, who, is, who are they being brought to bear to affect, right? People are, are making these more systemic moves about you know, who are we subjecting to algorithms and why and sort of ideas and, and isn't the deeper problem structural racism or isn't the deeper problem um, uh, structural sexism and the like. Um, but there's this whole discourse now that's blossoming around, um, around unpacking notions of fairness and accountability and bias and the like, um, and, and sort of what to do about it. And it's a fascinating conversation and, and there's an annual conference um, around that if you're interested. Um, but again, in the legal discourse, you know, the way we've been interacting with that has again been around looking for, you know, we're lawyers, we're looking for laws, you know, we're looking for things like, um, I think of like Solon Barakas as Andrew Selps's work on this disparate impact, for example, you know, or um, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, work um, in the um, employment context about employment discrimination, um, which I can I can link to you. But the but the point is is that you know we have um, been focusing on the law. So what Danielle and I are focusing on finally um, is not again process, but legitimacy. Okay, and this is your warning that this is where a there's gonna be a few minutes of administrative law. So if you, if this, if, if you need to shut your um, <laughs> sound off for a minute, ah, you know, that's really wise to record the meeting right when I'm about to talk about administrative law. I can see why you did that. You're like, wait, he's talking about administrative law? Well, I'm gonna record this. This has gotta be recorded. That's, that's right. That's how awesome administrative law is. Um, okay, so, so, um, you know, the, the whole idea of, um, of administrative law, which, you know, the law around agencies, it really grew up in the United States. There was a couple of inflection points, but one of the very important ones was around the New Deal and creating a bureaucracy and creating a set of administrative institutions that were capable of handling the great complexity and, and indeed the economic breakdown uh, of the United States. Um, it had been building up for some time, uh, but, the, but the basic ideas were hashed out in the courts and in a lot of early administrative law scholarship around that time of FDR and the New Deal. Because people began to in earnest sort of testing the limits um, of administrative agencies. Because administrative agencies are curious. They're curious. They're not, with a couple of exceptions, um, there is no reference to administrative agencies in the constitution and the constitutional scheme. Um, and the basic idea is that, you know, um, Congress uh, uh, you know, legislates um, and, you know, if, and then the, the uh, uh, executive carries out that, you know, enforces the law and then, um, you know, the, um, the judiciary uh, interprets it. Um, and, it's like the you know the, the the three fates you know the 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 way one spins and one measures and one cuts right it's it's this idea of that we have this tripartite government it has its different functions um, administrative agencies are curious in that um, it's not like Congress is saying here's here's the rules Congress is saying here's this thing that's going to make the rules 
here's this, we're gonna create something. It's almost like for those of you who, who know, um, like this, the famous story of like the, the uh, golem of, of Prague, for example, right? Where the, the, the Jewish people need protecting. And so a rabbi uh, creates a golem out of, uh, out of clay and, and instructs the golem to, to protect. Um, and then once it's served its purpose, the golem goes back to, to the earth, right? The idea is they're creating this entity and the entity is carrying out their will. One of my students once in doing a little primer video that's been watched like a couple hundred thousand times about what administrative law is, because administrative law is so damn interesting that when you make a video about it, hundreds of thousands of people watch that video. Anyway, that student did this and he, he's an artist and he, he drew uh, it as like, um, like a giant robot not unlike you know the giant robot in my background, and the giant robot was like made by Congress and governed by the APA, but meant to sort of do things. So the idea basically is that Congress makes these entities, and these entities go out and do things. But they, but these these administrative bureaucracies have been challenged, and there's a lot of skepticism around them, and some of that skepticism is sort of you know um, uh, understandable, right? Because um, they're they're not doing the, the they're, they're they're not sort of fitting into that pattern of just writing laws, executing laws or judging them, they're actually, if anything, combining multiple things together. And so they're raising a lot of separation of powers concerns because of course these different agencies have, uh, they rule, they make rules. So they make the rules themselves. <clears throat> they then enforce those rules. And then often they're the ones who are judging those rules up to a point. And so there's a lot of concerns about that. And so what you began to see was you know, pushback uh, especially around the New Deal, but the pushback took the form of, look, Congress, you can't just delegate your authority to some <clears throat> you know, entity that you make, you know what I mean? Like you gotta do the governing yourself. That's why you were elected. You can't make something else and then imbue it with the power to, to um, create laws. And then not only, not only that, but also like to judge those laws and to enforce those laws. That's not how it works. That's not, that's too much power. Um, and the, the, I'm summarizing a lot here, but I'm, 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 I'm condensing a lot together. But the basic idea was, well, look, we're, we need these administrative agencies. And so we're gonna bit look the other way at the fact that they're constitutionally a little anomalous and, and, and they do kind of combine separation of powers and they do some things we're not comfortable with because governing America is so complicated now. There's so much going on socially, technologically, economically, that it's just, it would be impossible for Congress to do all the direct governance. And so we need these agencies and we need them um, to be imbued with two incredibly important qualities that Congress lacks. And those qualities are expertise and flexibility. Why expertise and flexibility? Well, expertise, because in order to govern in a particular area, the EPA, for example, you don't understand environmental protection, you don't understand the environment, right? You need to have a different set of knowledge than any senator or congressperson. And, and, and but you also have a completely different set of knowledge from the folks that do defense or the folks that do uh, the Federal Trade Commission or the people that do um, election uh, work or, or communications work. So every agency has its own deep expertise. So when it does its governing, it's not just, you know, doing it willy nilly or, or like listening to whatever special interest or whatever happens to be. The idea is that it is accruing expertise. And the other thing too, is that, you know, these agencies are more, are more nimble <clears throat> and are supposed to be able to use their power to write rules and enforce those rules and to adjudge those rules um, in order to, tailor governance to individual circumstance and to be flexible and dynamic enough that they can respond to conditions on the ground. When things change, when a new polluter arises, when uh, justice requires something, that, you know, whatever it happens to be, they can be responsive and nimble and flexible at an individual level in a way that Congress cannot. And those are the, those are the justifications. Those are the justifications for, um, uh, you know, there are others, you know, some, some believe that there's actually a little bit of, of political um, insulation that, that, that agencies bring and so on. But the, but the basic bargain is, yeah, you can create these giant robots, you can create these golems in order to govern us because you, we need a repository of expertise and we need some flexibility.
And if we don't have those things, it's just not gonna be, we, we can't handle it. It's not gonna be wise, it's not gonna work. And that basic understanding has carried forward to this day. And there are skeptics of it and there are more skeptics of it now in the judiciary than ever before, or not, not than ever before, but than in, in recent memory. But the basic idea is that. Um, so now these very agencies and starting with the states, but also, um, Danielle and I believe, and there's evidence to believe that, you know, we're going to see this in the federal government as well, um, are turning to automation. And what is so revealing is not that automation is resulting in mistakes, which it is. And Danielle and I tell, tell a bunch of stories. Um, you know, uh, for those of you who are new to the academy or for anybody listening really, um, one of the things that Danielle's scholarship does so incredibly well is to um, upfront evidence to you what the harms are and to, and, to, and to tell you in a deep visceral, but it's like she uses anecdote, but she also uses you know, research and statistics and everything else to, to explain to you that there are harms and that they need to be addressed, right? And so in our work, we do that too. And I, you know, and I think that's critically important for scholarship to do, explain to you why it matters and who's being hurt and why this would motivate. And we come up with amazing stories about ways in which state automation has gone wrong. I mean, one of them, and if I get this wrong, Danielle, that's like, you know, not like tell me a flag with it. But one of them was an incredible instance where um, was it Oklahoma did this? Was it, uh, anyway, it, it, no, wait, maybe you could, yeah. It, anyway, um, I should have it in front of me, but there, there was an instance in which a state agency that was, um, that used to assess how much in-home care, uh, Arkansas, yep, yeah, exactly, sorry, sorry, Arkansas. So there was a, a system in Arkansas that was assessing how much in-home care people who were living with disabilities needed. And the way that it used to be done was a nurse. He or she would come to your house and ask you questions and, and look at your situation and, and talk to you about what was going on and then make a recommendation about how many hours you needed of support from the state. Um, but you know, to save money or be fair or whatever. So for some set of reasons, Arkansas decides, you know what, we're gonna automate this. And instead of having a human being make do, do this, this estimation, we're going to use this algorithm that was developed uh, by, a, by a third party or with the third party. Um, and so what they start to see is that the algorithm, um, first of all, dramatically reduces the amount of recommendation for in-service um, hours, which leaves a lot of people hurt and vulnerable uh, and may have been a secret reason to, to, to do this in the first place. Um, but also does things that are just inscrutable and, and would be funny if they weren't so horrible, right? I mean, and so we do talk about that. One of my uh, favorite examples or one of my least favorite examples um, is a situation where the algorithm um, took the fact that somebody had had their leg amputated um, as evidence that they no longer had foot problems and so reduce the amount of care that was recommended as a consequence of that, right? And so, I mean, these things are just, when you look at them, and so you can see why the headlines, <laughs> you can see why the headlines focus on, you know, algorithm is, is, is flawed and biased. It's so visceral. It's so, it's, it's so clear, right? Um, but what was so revealing to Danielle and I was not just how awful this was, because we knew it was awful, but how incredibly little the people in that system, the, the agency officials, even the folks who made the algorithms themselves, how little they understood about the systems that were being deployed that affected people's lives to the, to the tune of having someone in your house to help you because you're differently abled or not. You know what I mean? And so they didn't understand them. And that's why, you know, one of the important, um, uh, things that have happened since Danielle wrote Tech Due Process ha it hasn't just been a shift in thinking, but also has been all of this incredible litigation that has been brought by really brave, amazing attorneys who have rolled up their sleeves and like done the work and like looked at these algorithms and found plaintiffs who they hurt and so on. So all these, and, and so one place you could see this is um, there's like our paper. We, we talk about it a lot in our paper. And then also AI Now has a couple of uh, litigating algorithms reports. And it's just a collecting all these people who have, um, who have ultimately 
um, uh, spent all this time showing precisely how these algorithms aren't working and then deposing or even having on the stand the agency officials that administer them. And these agency officials, they don't understand what went wrong. They don't understand how the system worked. Even sometimes the people that built them can't figure it out. And you see this time and again, not just in, in Arkansas in disability, but also you know, in, in, in um, assessing the merit of teachers, um, in determining who should be kicked off of welfare, I mean, uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, benefits, you know, so social benefits and things like that. Uh, time and again, um, you see this pattern where real people are being hurt, but the people that are doing the hurting, the people that are that are behind these these automated systems, do not understand them at a basic level, and can't change them, and can't change them, and so you have this system that is inscrutable and inflexible. And if you study administrative law, alarm bells should be going off, right? Why? Because the whole reason we gave you this power, agencies, the whole reason you got this power that Congress didn't have to do this directly is because you were gonna accrue expertise and you were gonna be flexible and, and, and change with the times and dynamic and you threw away that expertise with both hands. And you threw away that ability to, to adapt to people's individual circumstance with both hands. And you're doing it over and over again. And yes, it's hurting real people and we should be mindful of that. It's hurting people in a way that is racialized, that is, that is, that is I mean, it, it, is, it is awful. Um, but let's also think about the way in which it fundamentally undermines the justification for the administrative state. Why aren't we talking about that? And so I don't know for Danielle, but for me, one of the things that's been most gratifying about this project has actually been to hear from administrative law professors who work in the field, who have written to us and said, this is really interesting, it didn't occur to me. And like, that was like the most gratifying thing um, about, about the project, apart from actually getting to work with, um, with Professor Citron. Um, so, you know, so this is a deep problem. It's a deep problem where, you know, we have, as a society, we have moved from a, a direct governance model to this mediated, attenuated um, uh, governance model, right? Um, to then a model where essentially that has been re-delegated to software and machines that the people doing the delegation don't understand and don't have anything even like the APA uh, in order to set any kinds of rules and so on, to go back to Danielle's, you know, and others or earlier points. This is a deep problem. It's a deep problem. Um, and so it, what it does is it raises basic legitimacy questions. So then, then, then what you sort of look at that and you say to yourself, okay, so what is the right, what's the right thing to do here, right? I mean, so one line of thinking is to say, well, um, we should give up on agencies. I mean, if they're just gonna re-delegate to software, then why doesn't Congress just contract with, you know, Palantir and write all the rule software for the nation? Because oh, <laughs> see people's eyebrows are going up. Maybe not Palantir, but they. Why doesn't Congress just hire some, uh, you know, a fancy development firm and and just come up with uh, these systems directly? Why do you even need uh, this inexpert intermediary, right? So you might say to yourself, you know, the administrative state is not justified, and we should bring back non-delegation. It only had that one good year, and. Need it, it needs more airing. Um, and, and I think at least, I'm so speaking for myself right now, I think that's completely backwards and that's not what we ought to be doing. And as a matter of fact, it plays right into the very strategy that landed us in automation in the first place. Because the reason we find ourselves with agencies that are constantly turning to automation is because they've been asked to do so much with so little. They have been defunded. They don't have the headcount. They don't have the support. They are scrutinized if they do anything that's like, some people would say activists, other people would say just doing what the Congress told them to do. So there's been a concerted effort. They faced a hostile political economy. And it's a little bit like defunding, Jerry Mashaw, the famous um, administrative law scholar makes this argument. It's a little bit like defunding the DMV and then using the fact that there are long lines in order to, get, in order to privatize what the DMV does. You see, you see the argument, right? You see, what you do is you make it impossible for them to do their job well by not giving them the resources that they need. Then you point to the bad job that they're doing, right? 
in order to privatize. It's quite a fascinating strategy, right? And so, um, you know, that's not what we want. That's not what we want. Um, I don't think, at least that's not what I want. Uh, I think agencies uh, are, are needed, I think, and I believe in the basic bargain. Um, another possibility is to say no tech, no tech. And, you know, you see this, you see this in no tech for ice, for example, right? And it's a very compelling argument. I'm not trying to um, diminish Mijente's work around no tech for ice, for example. Like the idea is don't give them the tools that they're using to oppress people. Um, and here, a, trend, you know, a, a little less uh, fraught in this environment would be to say, don't let them automate, don't let them touch technology, make them do everything by hand, you know, give them uh, pieces of paper and, and, <laughs> and, and pencils and make them do everything, you know what I mean? Like, so, but, but in a less sort of satirical way, put that nurse back in there, don't give them any technology, don't let them rely on technology. <clears throat> but I don't think that's the right answer either because technology is an important new set of affordances and government like everybody else ought to be able to use technology when doing so makes them more effective. And if anything, Danielle and I believe that the presence of this, these systems that are so powerful, if they're as powerful as people claim and they're not, they're not always, ratchets up our expectations for government. Now they have new tools, right? Um, uh, we might not think that the prosecutor um, who has to go through boxes and boxes of files is really going to be able to find that exculpatory piece of evidence and turn it over under Brady because she's just, you know, how could she do that? She, she can't go through all this material, but maybe an algorithm could go through all that material and find exculpatory evidence. And so maybe, um, you know, that was, that would ratchet up the expectation. So Danielle and I talk about ways in our paper um, in which government maybe ought to be looking at these new affordances of artificial intelligence, of automation, or whatever it happens to be in ways that are much better justified. And in fact, if anything, bolster the legitimacy of these agencies that, rather than to undermine them. Um, and so that would be, for example, looking inward is one of the things we talk about. So um, uh, Kate Crawford and I had written this piece about, um, about uh, AI and bias um, and nature early on. And we used this example of how the police in Chicago had been using these heat maps to try to figure out where crime was going to happen and that it, they resulted in, in not improving crime, but actually making more bad contact between the police and people of color in Chicago, according to like a RAND study. It was not like, you know, um, and so, uh, but then um, it, police began to use pattern recognition because that's what these systems do so well in order to see if they could find out whether they had problematic officers and try to and try to uh, rein them in and maybe you know try to spot a, 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 an officer who was predisposed to violence or racism um, so this idea of using it inward to diagnose to try to find problems rather than automate judicial um, decision making um, you know, uh, monitor the docket for inefficiencies, monitor the docket for um, uh, uh, biases and use that as a decision point. You know, a lot of the solutions that we were th thinking about really have to do with improving decision-making rather than automating something you're supposed to be doing yourself with humans. Um, uh, another example is access to justice. And so we borrowed this example from Justice Cuellar, um, who's a uh, Supreme Court of California uh, justice. Um, lots and lots of people need access to the courts and um, they can't get it because English is not their first language. In places like Puerto Rico, it has to be translated simultaneously into two different languages and there's long backlogs and you know, justice delayed is, is justice denied. And so can we use these actually pretty robust translation algorithms in order to fill the gap of translators and get people in, in, into court when they need to be earlier? Right? Um, how, how are we using automation the way we are when we have these uh, and not using it in these places where it could be very helpful? Now, do, you know, do these, do these, are there issues with these things? Absolutely, right? I mean, for example, um, Facebook uh, translation um, mistranslated good morning in Arabic, I wanna say, and made it sound like the person was making a threat and that person 
um, had, uh, I believe it was Palestinian and, and that person had Israeli authorities come to their house and, and interrogate them about this supposed threat that was mistranslated by, um, uh, by, by Facebook. I mean, it, it's, it can be fraught, right? All this stuff is fraught. But the idea is to look for places where what you're doing is you're enhancing uh, access to justice or you are looking internally to try to assess whether there might be problems of, of bias within your own institution. Um, and then the last one, and I won't, I won't dwell on this both because um, I've gone way over the time that I thought I would. Um, I, whenever I talk about administrative law, I can't be, I can't be reined in. Um, but I'll just say the last thing too is that um, <clears throat> there may eventually be a way in which artificial intelligence will help us model the world in a way that is better and to make wiser decisions by virtue of being able to model the world. Now that, that strategy is also fraught because there have been simulations that have justified some pretty um, awful assumptions of policy. But the basic idea is that, um, you know, to, I want you to take away is that they're, they're, these things are powerful tools and they should be explored for the kinds of applications that enhance legitimacy and <clears throat> raise the bar and allow us to um, uh, uh, deliver on our values or deliver on even new values in new ways, rather than how we're actually using automation, which is to throw away expertise and flexibility with both hands with the consequence that you know, we lose money, vulnerable people are hurt. There's bad headline after bad headline. Okay, um, so I really want to have a robust discussion, and I know we've set a time, a bunch of time aside for that. But um, you know, again, uh, it was, Danielle, it was a joy to work with you on this project, which is ongoing. We're still doing edits, so we can treat this a bit like a workshop too, if you have comments for us. Um, but uh, but anyway, and I'm delighted to to be able to kick off the speaker series because again, Northeastern is an incredible, incredible place. Thanks. I appreciate the virtual uh, and, and actual clap so very much. So what kinds of questions do people have? Uh, Tony, I don't know if you're gonna hold the queue or, or what he is or something like that, but I can sort of look at the, at the chat yeah, so, here. So um, if you do have your questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Also, I would encourage you if you feel comfortable doing this, um, get on screen or get on the mic and ask the question directly. People don't volunteer. Uh, Tony, I will look at. Tony, oh, do you ahead. want us to use the blue hand raise feature in order to organize this, or you just want us to shoot shout out? Um, so it so so when we've done this before, we usually ha didn't have a very long queue. Um, if we find ourselves with a queue, then please do just do a request to speak. Um, but uh, um, I'm comfortable with allowing folks to just kind of ask their questions in the chat, and then we'll go. Um, we'll address them in order. So, so just like that. That's it. Okay, so right. I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it looks like Alex has one too, yep. Yeah, there are several people that wanna speak. Um, uh, okay, so um, thank you so much for the presentation. I, uh, I, I, of course, I, I love this paper and I'm so glad that you guys are working together and I'm so glad you're, you're putting this together. Um, your both of your work in the area is um, so important. So it's great to see we're great to see this project coming together. Um, I wanted to talk about the concept of legitimacy because it's something about um, legal processes, both in, on the books and on the ground that I'm very interested in as well. And I I take your argument as it is not entirely based on, but derives from Danielle's technological due process argument to be focused on a particular kind of legitimacy, uh, perhaps Tom, uh, perhaps Tylerian legitimacy or uh, le a, a form of legitimacy, at least that is based on process. And that legitimacy, that idea, not Tom Tyler isn't the only guy that's talked about it, but he's kind of popularized it in the legal and political science and the social science literature that um, uh, people think that result like legal processes and legal results or results of legal systems are legitimate even when they go against their interests if they follow the right procedures if they're treated with people are treated with respect um, and so forth and he's done like all these studies about legitimacy of Supreme Court decisions all the way down to legitimacy of like uh, uh, traffic court and police interrogation so and police interactions 
So it's all about uh, process. And I get that that's what this project is. And I, um, I, I don't mean to suggest that, that changing that, uh, don't mean to suggest that you should change that at all, but I'm interested in your thoughts, having done this work already, about whether we should also think about legitimacy in a substantive way. That is that, I, that there are certain things that there may be certain things that an algorithm, even with the right processes, should just never decide. And that uh, almost like the difference between procedural and substantive due process, that sometimes we're cool with certain decisions as long as they follow the right procedure, but other times those procedures never merit any, uh, never merit certain deprivations of, of, of rights. So while this isn't technically your project, I wonder if you're interested in this conversation where people like uh, Frank Pasquale talked a little bit about this in his, um, in, in, in his forthcoming book on the new laws of robotics. Um, and it's something that I've been thinking about as well. Is it enough these days to think about the use of algorithm, to, to think about algorithmic legitimacy only in terms of the procedures used, or should we also be thinking about there are just some things, some substantive decisions that should absolutely never be made by algorithm, no, no matter how kosher those processes or no matter how cured those processes are? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I'm going to answer this question in my own way. Danielle, I invite you to jump in on any of this stuff, you know, too, because you may have your own views. So first of all, um, uh, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about in terms of law and technology is that we often don't state our assumptions, okay? So, you know, we make prescriptive claims about the world. It ought to be this way, it ought to be that way, right? Without grounding them in what the criteria are, <laughs> you know? And in fact, that was interesting. I went back and read um, early book reviews of, of, of tribes uh, channeling technology through law. And, mm. and that's what the book review said. They said, okay, technological assessment sounds great. We can channel technology with law. Why are we channeling it in the ways that you're saying, right? You know what I mean? And so, and so uh, you know, the, the, the truth is, is that legal scholarship is inherently normative, should be normative, but any scholarship that, that tells you what to do and evaluates something on some basis should have upfront its criteria, mm -hmm. okay? The criteria to date has been largely about whether or not uh, guarantees of the constitution and of statutes are being met, mm -hmm. right? Because that's a pretty straightforward claim. Like, Constitution says you have to do A, B, and C as interpreted by the Supreme Court. APA says you have to do A, B, and C. Not happening because of you know, the, way, the way we've shifted away. Danielle and I are making a different point, which is saying that um, you said that the reason that you know, agencies are justified is because they have expertise and they're flexible. Okay, that's what you said. Mm -hmm. That's the criteria you gave us. And these criteria is not being met, okay, by, um, by the current agencies because they don't have expertise and they're not flexible, right? So you're asking, what if we had a different set of criteria, right? Or what if the question that we were trying to evaluate is, are, you know, to, to use the sort of old uh, famous um, parlance of, are there some things that computers should not do, right? Um, this is like Jim Moore um, writing about ethics of computing in the 50s. Yeah. Um, and so you might look to examples of end of life decisions uh, or military use of AI to discriminate between um, different kinds, of, uh, different kinds of, uh, of targets and to make kill decisions, you know what I mean? And so then the question becomes, what are your criteria? Um, is, are you looking to international military law? Are you looking to uh, somehow for health law to furnish you criteria, you see what I mean? Um, and then depending on what the criteria are, or, or are you doing something perfectly fair, which is you're looking inward at your own moral compass or you're looking societally at the moral compass. But the, but, but the important thing, Ari, to me, is for all of us to state our criteria out loud. Otherwise we are just prescribing into the void. And you know what happens when you do that is you cede too much ground to implicit assumptions about cost benefit analysis, 
and utilita utilitarian is happy to fill any kind of void. And mm -hmm. you, know, you read tort law today, you read tort scholarship today, they don't even bother to say that they're doing law and economics. They just critique and evaluate systems on the basis of efficiency. Mm. You see what I mean? Like mm. they don't even say this is a law and economics paper. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because utilitarianism is very sneaky and will sneak into mm. any place where you don't, you know what I mean? So that's my answer. I don't know, Daniel might have a different answer, but. Okay, so other questions I know that there were. Can I say one thing is that it oh, is yeah. so much fun to hear, I guess everyone says this about you, Ryan, but every time you speak, I always feel smarter uh, than when I came in. So it is incredibly fun to hear you <laughs> talk about our paper. Um, and, uh, it, you know, just the idea of um, sort of procedure that substance that, that Ari was talking about, that, that the legitimacy question itself, that a presumption of expertise is a substantive commitment, right? Rather than a procedural one, right? Like mm -hmm. you, right? It, so that, that in many ways our paper is interrogating and reaffirming, right? The expertise commitment mm. of agencies. Um, so I was just writing Ryan a little note to you to say like, it's just it's such a pleasure always <laughs> to hear you speak. And, and, and you. I could not have done a better job on this if I tried. So thank you for that. It's fun to just be included. Thank you, Danielle um, and, and Ryan. I have a very short list. I have Alex, Jessica, and then um, Vipassana um, after. So we'll go Alex next with your question. Great. Um, hi, Ryan. I'm a big fan of your work and uh, Danielle's as well. So uh, thanks for the paper and thanks for uh, speaking with us today. Um, I really agree with the part of the diagnosis of the problem. Um, I want to ask you to look towards, I think, a group of people who are working on this pretty actively, which is the civic tech community. Um, I think you have a lot of uh, nonprofits, Code for America, Datakind, federal agencies, 18F, US Digital Service, working very hard to build uh, technology systems that both make government better and have legitimacy um, with models like building with the communities they're serving rather than build for, build without for. Um, and also fighting against predatory contractors, uh, which, which I, I certainly agree that that the contractors sort of leaching expertise, you know, building a system and then leaving and often those systems don't work has been an enormous failure of government technology. Um, and so I kind of want to ask what you, if you have advice for the people in that field, you know, I feel like they were a little underrepresented in the paper, right? They might look at the veterans affairs appeals process. So if you get injured and you're a veteran and you go to appeal how much money you get for your injury, Veterans Affairs will just tell you that can take five to seven years, right? And so that's that's the kind of problem they're looking at. Um, and so they might say, well, I don't know how nimble the current status quo is, right? But and and I, I don't, not to say you're you're too far apart, but I'm wondering what advice you would uh, give to them as they build systems to also build legitimacy. Alex, that's a great question. I mean, I think that only strengthens the the, the paper by pointing to the fact that, that 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 folks are looking at this and they're beginning to sort of understand this. And you, you know what I mean. And and uh, and hopefully, uh, what happened at the state level, which surely happened, and there's no question about that, right? The litigation is so clear. Maybe it won't be reprodu reproduced at the federal level because of of folks like the ones you're describing. But I think you're right that Danielle and I could uh, look into that further. Um, you know. Um, I, I I was lucky enough to get this big uh, a grant or big for me uh, grant um, to look at, at at automation and 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 um, uh, and and the government and I should have mentioned it actually that it's this French insurance giant's research arm so I think it's like Microsoft Research but it's it's AXA Research and um, and as part of that uh, a very talented PhD candidate. Um, uh, Maria Angel and I did a sort of systematic review also with our with our library, um, especially uh, Maya um, at the uh, uh, Grace at the library. Um, we, we did this um, systematic um, review of the kinds of values that procedure is looking to um, put forward. So we looked at criminal, constitutional, administrative, and civil procedure, just to try to do an inventory of the kind of values that procedure was was aiming at. And time and again, you see efficiency as a value. 
Um, and and it, initially you sort of look at that and say, oh, why are we sort of fetishizing efficiency? And you can look at like, you know, uh, work by like Brooke Coleman, for example, about how efficiency is taken over everything in, in procedure and so on. But there's a really easy answer to why we do that. And it is that um, you could have a perfect trial for a hundred people a year, right? But only those 100 people would get access to justice, right? And so a world in a fi that is finite um, in its resources, which is our world, um, efficiency has to be a norm because otherwise, you know, again, justice delayed is justice denied. Um, and so one of the projects that I w did with this, um, uh, with this project is, I, and this may seem suspicious to you, but I really legitimately did it, is I went to Italy which is very hard and, and difficult for me to go to Italy, um, and studied with a group of, of scholars there who were looking at making the Italian courts more efficient. And the way that they were doing that was by applying machine learning to um, actions and trying to figure out which ones would be good candidates for alternative dispute resolution. Um, and the great thing about alternative dispute resolution in that context is that it's, it's not mandatory. You have both parties have to opt in and if it doesn't work out and both people aren't satisfied, it gets kicked right back into the system. And you might think, well, doesn't that delay things? And it does, but the average like time to trial was like five years. You know, speaking of the veterans, what, what, what made me think about that, Alex, was your comment about the veterans' rights, right? Um, so it's such a long time frame that if you can get a resolution to that and AI can help you identify which ones are good candidates, that, that's maybe a net win for access to justice. So I completely agree with you that um, there are people working on these things. I have a lot more to say about co-development, but not enough time. So um, it's something I'm looking at for my book because a lot of times, whether it's technical assessment or law and technology generally, the, the answer since 60s, 70s has been, let's make the technology with the people that um, are gonna be using it. You know what I mean? And so there's like both more detail than you want and, and less detail than there needs to be in terms of what are best practices for co-developing technology for stakeholders. Um, anyway, I, I wanna make sure that we get all our questions out there at least. Thank you, Alex. Great, we've got Jessica, then we've got Matt, and then Vipassana. Great, thanks. Hi everyone, uh, Ryan, it was really great talk. Um, so I have, uh, I have two sort of big picture questions, well, I don't know if they're big picture, but anyway, two questions. One is a historical question about um, situating the problem in terms of the 20, 20th century dynamic of moving from factories to computers to artificial intelligence. That is sort of the faster paced um, big data, well, automated automation combined with big data problems, which seems um, to be going in one direction, combining the machines with the big data, with the automation. Um, and uh, I guess what I, wanna, what I wanna ask about that, that 21st century story is whether the problem you're describing in terms of um, the role of expertise and flexibility for administrative agencies is a culmination of that um, I, of that um, material capital story, um, or whether this is something different. Whether whether you can situate the story of the problem of the administrative state that you're describing um, um, outside what I think really is an economic story about capitalism, truly. Um, and the accumulation, the, the, the desire to accumulate um, uh, wealth in, um, in particular forms for particular purposes. And that's, that's very much animated by the efficiency question you've been talking about. So that's one question, is this, is this something different or is this, is this sort of the end part of the story of the 21st century factory computers? Um, and I, I think embedded in that question is whether um, the inscrutability of algorithms is different than the problem of computers generally and the, the fast paced nature of computational data structures. Um, and then the second question is much shorter. I, I guess I've, I've heard the argument before about inward looking use of algorithms. Um, uh, Professor Tina Eliassi Rod at, at uh, Northeastern talks about that quite a bit about the proper use 
of machine learning generally, so not algorithms specifically, but um, um, automated algorithms, um, mm -hmm. is to audit, to engage in self-auditing behavior of the experts. But I've never, I mean, I know Tina, and maybe I should ask her specifically, but maybe you have the answer. I've never understood that. Why does, why would that work any better than, I mean, if, if the algorithms are flawed in some way, why is using it as an audit mechanism any better than using it in any other way? Maybe that's just my own shortcomings of not understanding it, but I, I don't understand that argument. I'll, I'll treat, uh, those are both great questions. I'm gonna do them in reverse order. So, um, you know, there, that's a good question. Um, for you, you could very well imagine that a police department, for example, could go to audit its own um, uh, police officers, or a court could audit its own um, its own judges or, or staff, and lo and behold, uh, make mistakes and um, maybe even mistakes that that affect marginalized populations more. Right, the very things that we're we're really worried about. Um, I I think that the the, what I understand as being the major difference has to do with um, the capacity of those organizations to um, uh, the capacity of the people affected to have a conversation with the institution about um, how it is or isn't working. In other words, when you think about police using um, uh, heat maps with people in Chicago, right? There is this inherent power dynamic wherein they're policing and they're they're bringing the violence of the state into contact with with people, and those people don't have a very good voice. Whereas if you identify an officer who seems to be heading in a bad direction, that officer um, is an employee. Uh, they have uh, the, uh, union representation, uh, they have statutory protections, and so they may be in a better position to push back. The other thing is that um, it's who makes the decision. I mean, it's like, so you, you know, if you, if you find evidence of bias and you look into it, right, then you can, just, you can figure out hopefully uh, whether or not it's actually justified versus a situation where um, you know, you need to be forced to re-examine your decisions about who gets what benefits because of a lawsuit. You know what I mean? So it really has to do with like the ability to push back and the accountability measures, perhaps. Um, automation let me, let me is just, a, yeah. I, I'm just gonna say, to reframe what you're saying, it sounds like you say that an, it's an, an auditing or self-use of the, of the algorithm maximizes um, or allows for the user to exercise independent judgment about whether the auditing is coming to, is whether the auditing is helpful or not. Let, so let that let it's a combination you... of the algorithmic metric as well as the institutional organizational structure independent of that algorithm that combines to maximize the expertise. Right, and so, so first of all, the, the place where algorithms where software is most pernicious and is, is when there's an automated decision that has immediate effect. That's both true in safety context, but it's also true in this. So you're automatically denied that loan. You're automatically taken off of benefits. You're automatically this, automatically that. When you put a human being who's capable of making an independent assessment, that's already an improvement, A. B, I want you to consider, Jessica, the difference between um, an algorithm at your school that assesses um, what the merit pay should be for staff versus an algorithm at your school that assesses what the merit pay should be for faculty. How would that play out differently? Because the fact is the faculty have more of a voice. And so if the thing is messing with faculty, gosh, you know what I mean? Like, look what happens, right? Look what happens if you mess with that. All of a sudden it's like the provost can't have dinner. You know what I mean? Um, versus, you know, students who have to protest in the streets versus staff who, you know what I mean? And so I think it also matters like against where do you bring it to bear? Like where, you know, are these folks vulnerable? Do they have the ability to push back? You know what I mean? So I think you're right. It is a function both of of the, the use case and, and also the, the immediacy. I think you do need to have a, a person in the loop. I'm gonna make the same argument essentially about why exposure notification apps are a bad idea versus 
human contact tracing, though they have some of the same challenges. But anyway, it's I, I got to think more. Now, your other question, I don't have a good answer to. Um, I, we do write a bit in the piece about how it is the political economy that administrative agencies have faced since Ronald Reagan that causes them to have to do more and more with less and less and less and makes them feel like they need to turn to automation, which then becomes this evidence that they're not working. Um, so I would also say that the, the chief way in which um, agencies are restrained by a skeptical political environment have to do with introducing cost benefit analysis, which is we see that very clearly in the FTC um, unfairness doctrine. Right, where in 1980, like con a Republican Congress was like upset about the FTC being too doing what it was supposed to do all along, um, and uh, in my view, uh, and then uh, and then the way that they put the brakes on was by saying, why don't you do some cost benefit analysis, which has the has the effect of, um, you know, uh, causing resources to flow to their highest value use, which in turn aggregates wealth in a particular way, right? Um, and so I do think there's an undermining of the regulatory state that's happening through resource restriction, as well as through introducing cost benefit analysis. I do believe that that's the case. And I just don't have more, anything more sophisticated to say than that. Um, all right, I think I'm up, right? The, um, thank you. Um, so I really, this has been a, a real pleasure. I really enjoyed this. Uh, and I really like the project and largely agree with it. Um, I did want to push back a little bit on the centrality of expertise to the argument. So I think in theory, and here's why, right? In theory, if, in not, if not in practice, the algorithms that an agency creates can be created based on their expertise in the area. But to, to some extent, they're, I assume they're contributing um, their knowledge to the creation of the algorithm, at least to some extent. So I, I guess my first question, and I have a second, but my first question is, are we sure that they're throwing away their subject matter expertise when they create this code, or at least instruct others to create this code? Um, and then maybe more helpfully, right? Why might algorithms in administrative law be problematic, even if we're not that worried about the expertise point, or even if every agency worker gets a degree in uh, machine learning and computer science? Here are two suggestions. Um, just sort of thoughts that I'd, that I'd love to uh, hear your reactions to. But so, and you may have written about these, so forgive me for, uh, about that. But first um, is that uh, algorithms may be too far removed from political accountability, right? Congress has already passed political accountability to these unelected agencies, even you know, long before computers uh, came around. Now those agencies are sort of passing policymaking in some sense to AIs, which not only do they not understand, but you know, voters certainly don't understand. And they say, well, you know, they say, look, we created this algorithm and you, sorry, it tells us that, you, that we have to withdraw your you know, health benefits. That's sort of an even step further down the road against uh, political accountability that might concern us. And then a, a second thing is you said that these algorithms are really difficult to change. And I guess, so my second question is, um, uh, is that right? Can you, know, can you uh, talk more about that? That seems huge to me because um, one mitigator of the problems that you that you talk about is, look, agencies create procedural rules without notice and comment all the time. And the flip side of it is they can be changed easily without notice and comment. And so if that's not the case because of automation, that seems like a huge concern uh, and, a, and a big sort of argument in your favor about why these are concerning. Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm going to I'm going to once again. Um... Reverse those. So, so in terms of uh, being too far removed politically, and um, uh, and 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 be essentially uh, rule making happening surreptitiously all the time, those things are things that I think Danielle has written about, um, and I don't know that I could improve upon it. Um, uh, they also tend to undermine the legitimacy of agencies, right? So I agree. And so we kind of, um, you know, uh, in, in some ways our project is, is really more about emphasis than it is about, about substance. And we do have the benefit of this five, six, seven years of like seriously problematic litigation to draw from, right? And I think that helps a lot with your with your first question. I'll get right back to that. We do have that. We have all this evidence that you know um, that of what's happening in practice. Um, but you know, 
a lot of it has to do with emphasis. It's, it's an emphasizing not that safeguards are being eroded and thereby creating a, a, a one kind of problem, but rather that um, uh, the justification for the administrative state itself, right? So what you, you know, one way to think about that is, um, you know, not, so not only did we justify, we justified the creation of administrative state by virtue of flexibility and individuation and, um, and expertise, but then we did so not without limits. We also introduced constitutional statutory limits, right? And so a lot has been written about that second problem, which is that these things are these things these systems are not able to be held accountable. You know, we struck a bargain, but the way that we're supposed to control the golem is not has been undermined. You see what I mean? Whereas Danielle in this piece are kind of we're stepping back and we're saying actually the fundamental reason why we delegated in the first place is being eroded. You know what I mean? And so I don't, I, I think what you're, part of what I hear you saying, and I think you're exactly right, is that those things are also legitimacy things, you know? And if we're, and, if, and, and so if we're talking about the legitimacy crisis, uh, we ought to be naming <laughs> these other things as being that. And I agree with you. Um, on the, could they have expertise? That's a fascinating question. And I think about it a lot. So what, it's like sort of asking like, is this a contingent problem or is it a, intrinsic problem, you know what I mean? And I think it may be largely contingent, but the evidence has been overwhelming so far that they do not understand these systems. And to the extent that they're adopting mechanisms like machine learning <clears throat> that do not admit of de black boxing easily, you know what I mean? You could imagine it being an intrinsic concern. You see what I mean? That, that, the, that, that their expertise would be in how do I bring to bear this pattern recognition engine in a way that reliably comes up with these results? You know, um, and that becomes the expertise. Go, go ahead, Matt. Sure. Oh, sure. I, I mean, I would just, I mean, to some extent, it's just sort of a, a code is law uh, uh, concept where we could at least imagine, it may not be the case if, if we're talking about advanced machine learning and yeah, black box uh, algorithms issues, it may be intrinsic. In theory, I, I guess my question is more a theoretical one. Like in theory, you could design an algorithmic system that you understand and that really reflects your subject matter expertise and you're tweaking the rules. And it, you know, all you're doing is sort of, it, it, all it would be is like automated rule application where we say, we're gonna set these rigid rules based on our expertise and then let this machine or even <laughs> someone tells us we can't I use see. machines, yeah. okay? And we hire 10,000 workers and, it, and they perform identically to the machine. In theory, that's possible. But I mean, it's a good response to say, yeah, in theory, but in practice, they're uh, trying to use this tool that they just don't understand, and they're really doing a poor job of, of embedding their expertise in code. I think, I think, Matt, it's at least that, but I actually have a, a slightly different intuition, and we have, this is not in the paper, and maybe it should be, but I mean, um, it's also a different configuration, because if it turns out that there's a bunch of people that are able reliably to translate law into, you know, uh, in, in, into code, right? It's a, it's a big team that's managed by like Harry Certain, you know what I mean? And like <laughs> Latanya Sweeney, it's like, you know what I mean? It's like this big, you know, it's like this big team that is really good at that. Then that's all you need. You just need one giant agency. And all that agency does is take the will of Congress and translate it into code in a super reliable expert way. You see what I mean? It, it just justifies a different configuration that I wonder whether we would really be, <laughs> be comfortable with, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, that's I'm I'm satisfied. That's uh, um, thank you. That was great. It's it's very it's a very good provocation as as always. Thank you. Do we have time for one more, Tony? Or are we out of time? Or yeah. Uh, yeah, we do have time for one more. Um, Vipassana or uh, yeah, Vipassana. Vipassana. Hi, thank you. Uh, your last comment actually goes very well into my next question. Um, it was interesting to hear you talk about agencies as allowing for both expertise and flexibility. So with tech used in agencies. And you know, if you want to evaluate how that tech impacts um, uh, the lives of people, it seems like there might be the value for an agency to evaluate the use of tech in government. Um, do you see that as a possibility? If yes, how do you? What sort of legit legitimacy concerns do you think uh, might come up? Yeah, I mean, so uh, this is one of my favorite subjects because I've sort of been thinking before about um, where should the repository of expertise in technology be in the government, right? Lots of people 
acknowledge that there is inadequate expertise in government. And in fact, it's problematic on a number of levels because of what we're talking about, but also just like, if you don't have people that can kick the tires on, um, like Alex was alluding to earlier, like if you don't have people that can tell who's selling snake oil or who is, uh, if, if it was a predatory procurement, you know, if you just can't tell whether they're selling you something that works or you don't, you know, th then, then you have to rely on, on industry's word for it. If you're a Congress and you don't have the Office of Technology Assessment because it's been defunded in the, in the, in the 90s by, by the Gingrich uh, crowd, um, how, can you, how can you really reliably come up with, with good um, governance of technology? Um, and so one model says that every agency should just have a bunch of people with PhDs in machine learning. You know what I mean? Um, and that's one model, but it strikes me as that would be inefficient and, and, and speaking of inefficient, but it would be, um, be hard to pull off. And that in fact, it'd be particularly difficult to attract talent away from academia and especially industry. And so I've argued that there ought to be like one ring to bind them all, like a central repository, like a one agency, the purpose of which is to like have cutting edge technical acumen on the same order, like a NASA for everything. You know, but it, to me, it's a sort of institutional question about whether or not um, whether or not there should be one body that is deeply technical and is able to talk to everybody else and and be a, and be a resource, versus whether or not we should be embedding technologists in different parts of of government and or both. You know what I mean? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know where I come down in the end. I mean, I, I, I do see reasons why there would be a really good thing to be what however you describe, which is, in fact, a, a one body that's capable of helping courts, helping the legislature, helping like kind of like a, a NASA, but combined with the um, Congressional Research Service, but for all branches. I mean, whatever, you know, you can talk about that. But it's a great question and it's a deep one. And it's something that, by the way, um, academic institution study, we, we struggle with this too. So. Is it better to have like, if you're gonna do computational biology, is it better that every biology lab has a computation, has a CS person in it? Or is it better that everybody doing biology today learn a little bit about computer science? You, you see what I mean? Or is it better to have like some unbelievable repository on campus where anybody can go with a computational question? You know, it's, it's hard, it's hard to know and it's full of trade-offs, but it's a great question. Thank you. So I know that there's one more question, but we are over time. Um, so uh, apologize, Claudia, we won't be able to get to your question now. Email me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Feel, feel free to email, um, email Ryan, but I just wanna thank everybody for joining us. Um, this was a phenomenal talk. Um, I know I learned a considerable amount and took copious notes. Um, and for everybody that's watching, um, the event has been recorded. So I know uh, many of us are gonna rewatch this and take additional notes um, just because there was just so much um, richness here in terms of um, uh, 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 the paper that you're working on. Um, and so also Danielle, thank you also for um, one, partnering with Ryan on this work, doing this work together, but also joining us for this um, conversation and um, contributing to the discussion as well. Um, so that concludes today's, um, today's lecture. Thank you again, uh, Ryan, so much. Yes, applause. Thanks everyone. Um, hopefully we can, um, you know, when, when COVID is over, whatever that means, um, we can uh, get, we can get you in the room and 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 uh, continue this discussion. Um, but for now, feel free to follow us online. We're also going to share many of the links. Thank you, Woody, also for sharing the many links to um, folks' papers and research. Um, we're going to send that to everyone in our kind of close out thank you message, just so that if you wanted to do some additional reading, that's available to you as well. But feel free to to be in touch otherwise. And uh, everyone, have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you all. Thanks for the great question.